Thanks, and we continue to follow breaking news. That earthquake rocking San Diego, also other parts of Southern California. Yeah, in case you're just joining us, it's been classified as a 5.2 magnitude quake. Epicenter about 13, 14 miles north northwest of Borrego Springs. Take a look at this map. It'll give you a better sense of where it was in relation to nearby cities. Tremors being felt all the way up to Los Angeles, through Los Angeles, and down to Mexico. Geologist and earthquake expert Pat Abbott is joining us now. So what people a lot of times fear after this, because we haven't gotten any reports of injuries or major damage, is what about going forward? Do we need to be worried about something bigger coming? Well, these are very potent faults. These are faults that can easily do magnitude 7.5, 7.8 earthquakes. So in that sense, it's always a concern. Now, specifically, when you get a 5.2 magnitude earthquake, that's a significant movement. A few miles below ground, a two mile long rupture. That puts a lot of pressure on the adjoining areas. And that pressure we're seeing now is the aftershocks. That's, tr that's, that's triggering all these little threes and 3.5 magnitude earthquakes. But it's also possible, maybe two to 4%, that chance that that would trigger a bigger movement. See, in other words, we don't look at an earthquake as an event. Mm -hmm. We look at it as a series of events that takes place over weeks or months. So we're in an event now. Is this 5.2 the big one in this event? Or is this going to turn out to be a trigger for something even larger? But you said that that chance is low, 2.4%? 2 to 4%. 2 to 4%. Uh, uh, it's, it's a rough feel for it. So in other words, see, that's not a scientific statement as much as it is looking back through the historic record. And you say, well, how many times when one of these occurred did a bigger one occur afterwards? And that's where we get kind of just a, a feel or an estimate for it. And it's also a reminder of how difficult, you know, we, we, we're trying to build earthquake prediction technology to, to get a better sense before it happens. You know, a lot of people were shaken awake overnight because it was already happening. Where are we on that technology? We've been talking about the, the drive to try to build a warning system here where you could get maybe up to a minute warning and, and explain why that would be valuable. Well, it's two different things now. One is the prediction and where are we on that? I'll tell you, and it's not pretty. We know zero, zip, not a nothing. If anybody says wow. they do know how to predict, be very suspicious of anything else they said. Now, a warning system. This is different now. This is once an earthquake began. Some of the reports we've been hearing here, people talking about feeling these different kinds of shaking. After an earthquake, the first waves, the fastest ones kind of go like this, like a slinky toy. They don't do much damage. The second fastest waves that come along go like this. That's breaking foundations and buildings. So the warning system is this. If you're right where the earthquake occurs, no warning. But the farther away you are, these relatively harmless ones arrive first so they can warn you that these other ones are following. And how much warning time you get depends on how far away from the epicenter you are. And that warning can make a big difference in terms of taking huge. cover, in terms of getting patients to safety, all sorts of things. All sorts. I think the Japanese are the first ones who have done it, and they applied it like to their bullet train. So instead of like having it go through somebody's brain, oh, an earthquake, let's shut things down, have it go directly in there and start decelerating or right. slowing down, stopping the train. Right. So there's a lot of ways like that this can do some good. But this isn't for everybody, though. You have to be away from the epicenter, mm -hmm. and it has to be a really big earthquake. Right. Wow. Pat Abbott, thank you so much.